This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston in our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Uh, welcome to Mosaic. My name is Andy. I'm uh, one of the pastors here along with Pastor Jan and Pastor Shane. I'm filling in today for Pastor Jan. Pray for him. He is off getting equipped for the sake of our congregation, doing some doctoral work this week. Pastor Shane's going to fill in next week for him. Uh, if you are new to Mosaic, just want to plug uh, right away before I forget. Uh, there's a lot of new faces here, or half faces at least. We're pumped that you're here. And uh, the primary way to connect on a Sunday so that we know you're here, we know you want to get plugged in, is to fill out a connection card. We have them in the worship guides uh, in the lobby. You can grab one on the way out. If you fill one out, put it in and walk to the Welcome Center, hand it off. Uh, we will have a gift for you just for joining us. And if you give us your address, we will send you another gift just to, out of excitement that you're here worshiping with us. And we want to get to know you. We want to connect you and uh, pray for you if you have any concerns or needs. Uh, today, I just want to point out, we are having one service, so that's why it's a little tighter here today. We normally have 9.15 and 11.15 service. The temple has uh, a member of their congregation passed this week. They're having a funeral. We are uh, expected to be out of the building by 11 a.m., so uh, we just have this one service, and if you can help with Teardown in the lobby afterwards, feel free to do so, essentially. Uh, everything in the lobby goes down the stairs to the right. And if there's trash in the pews, please take it out and toss it. You can recycle the pens and the papers um, just by putting them on the tables out there. Uh, but uh, today we are continuing our book, um, our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. And this is a series we're calling Prodigal Church 2. We've been in here 16, I think this is the 17th week. Uh, we have two more weeks after this. And this is a book <clears throat> with a lot of church doctrine, a lot of talk about uh, just what, how the church would function. What is the role of a pastor? What is the role of a leader? What does that engagement between the community and the leader look like? And Paul, uh, the greatest uh, Christian outside of Jesus Christ, the most influential Christian in history, wrote most of the New Testament. He, he's engaging at this point in the book with teachers who have come into the Corinth church and who are questioning his authority. They are boasting and in the fact that they have experienced less suffering than him. Uh, but last week he talks about it's his weakness, the actual fact that he suffered for the sake of the gospel that proves his, his authority. Uh, furthermore, today he's entering into a topic of, of spiritual experiences. In this day, the, the false teachers have thought, this is the trump card. We have this over Paul. Uh, these experiences that we were bragging about in the community. Paul, you see, he says, these experiences really don't matter. And he gives us lessons about power, authority, what that looks like as a leader, what that looks like for an average Christian in Jesus Christ. So let me read uh, today's sermon. It's going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. And its primary focus is on God's power manifesting in weakness. So 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. I must go on boasting, for there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Even if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. 
But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of our Lord. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you today that we get to worship you. Lord, you have purposes that you need to accomplish, and uh, I just admit right before you that I cannot do that in my own power. Holy Spirit, we pray, come, do your work, convict us uh, where we need repentance, poke us uh, in the side, give us a thorn if we need to be humbled. Uh, Lord, give us conviction Uh, to pursue you more faithfully in this season, in this year, Lord. Let us leave here today with a desire to see your power at work in us and with a greater appreciation of your daily grace uh, provided to us in our weakness. Holy Spirit, please guide us right now. Let us enjoy your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. So two weeks have passed uh, in January, so it's time to ask the question, How are you doing with your New Year's resolution? Have you made it this far, January 16th? Did you even make it a day? Um, Have you made it this far, two weeks in, but you're so exhausted from structuring your life for two weeks to maintain it that you're you're afraid you're going to trail off this week? Uh, Me, this year I formulated my New Year's resolution by thinking about Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Uh, I want to be that tree that does not, whose leaf does not wither this year. I don't know about you, but if 2022 is going to be anything like 2020, 2021, I want to get through it without withering. And uh, just if the season's going to continue, and I have a five-year-old, I've got an 18-month-old, we have a third baby on the way, I'm going to need something more than my own strength. Um, I'm feeling fatigue. I'm, I'm just looking, God, where is, where is the gas going to come from? Not enough coffee, not enough effort, not enough sleep, not added hours of the day could help me with what's ahead. And so just where, where are you as you approach this year? Um, as I read this epic, well-known scripture today, um, I can't emphasize, can't help but emphasize talking about power. Uh, Verse 9, the famous verse, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Power. I don't know about you, but historically in my prayer life, I tend to pray in the language of Advent. Uh, Lord, let me know your love more. Lord, give me hope that you are here with me in this moment. Lord, let your peace fill me and satisfy me. Let my heart rejoice in Jesus Christ. Um, I haven't throughout my life talked much about power. I haven't asked for it. Um, But uh, if you're anything like me, we we can't function like that. Power is a huge part of Christianity, right? We don't just believe in a God of kind sentiment, of comforting words, of interesting teachings. We believe in an all-powerful God. Jesus had the power to rise from the dead um, and conquer death once and for all for us that in him we might have salvation and eternal life. He has the power to forgive our sins and wash us clean and sanctify us. The gospel, Romans says, is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. There's a power when the God's word is proclaimed. Um, one of my favorite depictions of God's power is that the kind of power that uh, goes with God's kingdom uh, when, it's, when it enters into a person. Matthew 9, 16 and 17. No, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. 
but new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. What this is talking about is that when the kingdom of God, Christ's rule and reign, enters into a person's heart by faith, it tears, it bubbles up, it bursts, it destroys all parts of the old man in a person that they might become new in Jesus. God's power, his, his rule, his desire is going to accomplish its effect. It's a matter of how will we let it or not? Will we fight it? How much will we fight it before we submit and enjoy it and embrace it? Uh, my other favorite part, depiction of Christ's power, comes from the book of 2 Corinthians 2. Uh, chapter 2, actually. It's a passage that we could say in for weeks. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 17 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we, Christians, are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to, to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God we speak in Christ. Uh, it's this, this tr idea of God always leads us in triumphal procession. It's this imagery of a glorious, powerful Christian life. And, and what's this thing, triumphal procession, it's, it goes back to the lavish parades and celebrations in ancient Rome that they entered the city in the arches um, with the columns all around. The victorious generals arrived back after winning a battle, winning a war with their captives behind them. It's this image of celebration when you watch the Super Bowl and you see Roger Goodell get booed and then hand the Super Bowl trophy off to the MVP of the winning team, the confetti's flying around. It's this imagery. Our life is one of triumphal procession. And, um, and, in, and what normally happens in a triumphal procession, the general takes those captives back and at the end of, when they get into the city, they just slaughter them. But in Christianity, God is the sovereign victor. Christ is our general. He takes us back as captives into his city and instead of slaughtering us, he forgives us, he redeems us and he gives us a sword. He commissions us to work for his kingdom, for his cause. All the power of his authority is at our backing. And that's the life that we get to live in Jesus Christ. A life of power. The sovereign creator of the universe calls us. He saves us in Christ. And he, he enlists us. And though I want to say uh, this, there's power in that life. What does, what's the power that we exhibit? For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. He uses us, us weak vessels. He calls us jars of clay uh, later in um, Corinthians uh, to save people. When we go out in the Lord's power and preach his word, share his word, live out the gospel, he uses us uh, to save people. It's a, an aroma of life that draws people in, God's children in. But also there is failure. It's not just one of success after success after success. When we preach the word, we share it, there will be rejection. And, and it's a fragrance that when we share God's word, it's a fragrance from death to death. It just doesn't smell of life to others. And so uh, God's purpose, when we have success in sharing the gospel, when we have failure, his purpose still goes forward. And so it's just mind-boggling to think about this is just a, a little small glimpse into just the powerful life of a Christian. And um, it's a life of great purpose. And I, I just ask, do you want a life of power? Do you want a life of purpose? Uh, and that's, that's what Paul brings us to today. He talks about uh, just ways that we can experience God's power. And so I have three points today. To see God's power manifest in your life, remember the works of God, be realistic about God's discipline, let Christ's power rest on you. So remember the works of God. Um, and before I read verses, I want to remind you that the author of our passage today, this is 
one of a guy who, before he was saved, he was one of the greatest persecutors of Christians. Jesus saves him, and the Bible tells us that he went on to become just the, the writer of most of the New Testament. He pl- walked thousands of miles planting church after church and shepherding those communities and uh, just an incredible ministry. So his words are wisdom. He's a refined old man giving us the wisdom that he's attained over the years. So he says, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go into visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. So this is... We're just tapping, hitting the surface of this passage. But here is primarily what's going on. Uh, but Paul, he's talking about a time when he's been taken up into heaven. Uh, there's this confusing language uh, where he enters. He talks about it in the third person. Um, he also go, but every commentator says, this is Paul. Uh, he also says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of my body. Uh, The thing that he's trying to say is that God did this thing in my life. God showed up. And this is the first key to having God's power come into your life, acknowledging God showed up. Um, So you have to be able to say at some point, God came and did something in your life. You have to be able to retell of God's works in your life if you want to experience his power. And if you perhaps you can't, do it, perhaps you, you don't truly have God in your life. Uh, just throughout scripture, there's this practice of recounting God's deeds. Uh, the prophets in days when it was just a barren harvest uh, in their ministry, they, they recounted the wondrous deeds of God, their work, his work in their life. Isaiah 63, 7, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Uh, Psalm 77, 11, it's, it's all about recollection of God's power. It says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Uh, you see, I grew up in the church uh, for 23 years, I attended 99% of the weeks, uh, even through college. I liked the community. I made good friends. I liked to study Jesus as a nice guy uh, with the, these interesting countercultural teachings. Um, but I never really understood my sin, my need for a savior. At the age of 23 here at Mosaic, uh, it was the first time that as I studied the scriptures, as Pastor Jan preached them, this understanding of God as this holy, all-powerful, all-knowing, infinite, eternal, unchangeable creator, uh, I, I could not have peace with him. And I realized that before him, I was but a lowly sinner. And that's where I I saw my need. I can only have peace with God by the work of Jesus Christ. Who has the record that I, perfect record that I do not have, but died on the cross for me? Um, So you see, when you talk about God's power, um, it gives you hope for God's power. When you talk about God's power in the past, it gives you hope for God's power in your present. And that's what the Apostle Paul is, is showing us here. And so I ask, do you remember God's work in your life? Um, Do you remember the hope that you experienced, the burden and guilt that was taken away when you first truly confessed your sins and received God's grace? What year did that happen? What day? Um, Just what was your Bible reading like in that season? Did you tear through chapter after chapter, book after book? Did you serve a lot? You know, did you go to every possible service that you could go, get to. I know some of you are in that right now. Um, I remember in that season for me, I was that guy in the front of the congregation 
uh, in a much smaller room, about one-tenth the size of this. I was in the front row, right in Pastor Jan's face. I couldn't get enough. I wanted to be there. I wanted to hear. I wanted to feel it. There wouldn't be anybody close to me. They'd be five rows back. And just talking about it now, it inspires hope in me. And it, it, it reminds me, Lord, you moved in my life profoundly then. You gave me the power to repent of sin and truly have victory over it. You took away that guilt and shame that weighed me down for ages. I had pain and trial in that season, yet you sent people, you sent friends, you sent church community. You gave me the perspective that I needed. And you can do it now. I can have your power today. So how about you? Do you know God's power in the past? Does it excite you to think about it? Does it give you hope today that you can have that? Do you feel like it's awakening uh, this, this desire, this movement in your life? Uh, the greatest, uh, just one of the greatest enemies of, for a Christian is just not feeling anything. And so Paul shows us, recollect uh, God's work. Um, all of that vision, he says, this was not me. I was taken up into heaven. And so think about those times when God, he grasped you. He seized you. He shook you. Let's read on. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So what's happening? Paul talks about having one of the greatest experiences of any human being to walk the earth, probably the greatest of anyone who, who is still alive. And he's in heaven, and he comes down to real life. God gives him this poke, this thorn. Uh, it's like going on a February vacation to a tropical destination or Florida, in mid-February, and then coming back to Boston. It's not, like, is this not real life? Is this not what the Christian life feels like? Sometimes you have these high moments where the, the Spirit of God's just coursing through your veins. You have such clarity, such focus of mission and vision, uh, and then you come down. Uh, what happens to me in these uh, moments is uh, I have a tendency to say, well, that's life. Say la vie. Like, take the, just got to take the good with the bad. If things can go wrong, they will go wrong. Uh, that's not how Paul responds. Uh, Paul is realistic about God's discipline. You know, he doesn't just see this, this struggle, this torment that God exposes to him uh, as something to just accept, to, to just ignore. Uh, Paul in his wisdom, he's realistic about this fault. He says, God did this. God is the one who is responsible for this. This isn't just how life goes. There is a purpose. There is a meaning. This was sent from my creator, my father. And so what God gives him, he gives him this, this pain, this prick, this thorn uh, that he receives, and he gives God credit. Um, how many of you are just kind of going up and down in your spiritual life. And when the bad comes, you just ignore it. You shed it off. You don't view it as part of something that God could be bringing to your life for his purpose, uh, for, for his redeeming purposes, for the, your growth. Um, now a lot of debate goes into what the thorn was. Um, a lot of the theologians lift out, list out the options, uh, but all of them say we can't fully know. What can we know? It was a pain. It was really irritating to Paul. Uh, I think this time of year, like the little cracks, the cuts that you get on your fingertips by your fingernails in the dry, cold weather, those are the worst. Uh, the thing about them is that this little tiny cut, this little tiny prick puts a damper on your whole day. My son had this huge one on his finger now. The whole family was feeling pain for all of December while this thing was healing and opening up and closing. And, uh, but that's, that's what this thorn was like. 
Uh, this thorn was a pain, and Paul probably viewed it as it limited his ability to do ministry well. Um, but what's the purpose of this thorn? What's the purpose of God giving him that experience? It's to weaken Paul in order to humble him. Uh, the text makes it really clear that it's not to punish him, but to train him. This is the discipline of God the Father. It's not, it, he's working out our sanctification, our growth and holiness so that we might be able to wield more of his power and his authority. Hebrews 12 talks about 5 and 6. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Uh, this isn't God punish him punishing him, it's God purifying him. It's not God torturing him, it's not God training him. This is not God torturing us, it's training us. Uh, we need, uh, in order to experience his power, to wield his power, to be faithful stewards of it, we need to experience his discipline. Uh, the only time that we can actually do such training is when we're at our weakness. Uh, think about it. Uh, are you open to lessons when things are going well? Do you have ears to listen to God when things are smooth sailing? Do you want to hear your elders, your parents, when things are going well? No, of course not. This is one of the hardest parts of discipleship in the church. Uh, you have a lot of young people, and I'm, I'm still kind of young, but I'm a and a little older than a, a lot of a majority of our congregation, you have a lot of people asking for discipleship, and you provide it, and it doesn't look like what, what they want, uh, and they don't receive it. It's only when there's falls, when th the, the foundations are being shaken, that we, when we're weak and when our weakness is exposed, our strength appears to be limited that we're in a position to learn, to hear from God, to hear from his people. Uh, thorns get our attention. Uh, when, when we can't shake them, when we can't in our own strength just overcome them, we have nowhere else to go but down on our knees in prayer. Um, God brings us to our knees intentionally to get our attention. Uh, the thorn forces us to relinquish every lofty thought, uh, every high th thinking uh, that we have, form of thinking that we have about ourselves and our own strength. It brings us to the point of humility to ask for his help. Um, and without this experience, we start thinking that we're strong. We're strong enough without God. We're here in positions of esteem. We have success in life and ministry apart from God. Uh, we can attain power and, we, power and wield it without him, handle it without him. And that, that's what pride is. That's a sin. That's as filthy as any rebellious sin. We need to repent of that. So God wants to keep us. He gives us these thorns because he wants to keep us from being conceited. He does everything he can to squeeze out, tear up, bubble out parts of our identity that lead us to think that we can get by without him. Now, we don't know what Paul's thorn was. But we do know that he talked to God about it, and he really wanted God to take it away. Um, and, and I just want to point out, Paul actually took it to God in prayer. I, I don't know about you, but I, sometimes when I am unhappy with the, the direction of things, when I know I've got this struggle, I've got this prick, I've got this, this thing that I think is holding me up from accomplishing what I want, uh, I, I don't like to take it to God because I know what his response is going to be. I don't like to take it to other Christian people because they're going to tell us, tell me to consider uh, God's daily grace, to consider his sovereign purposes in the moment. And, and Paul does that. We should follow him in that. We should not look and seek pain. Uh, we should ask the Lord to remove it. Um, but, um, but the Lord didn't take it away. And um, so, so what is your thorn? What's that thing that you want God to take away? What's the thing that you're bringing to God in prayer and asking him constantly to take away? 
have you pause to say, Lord, what are you teaching me through this? How are you humbling me through this? How am I growing through this? Lord, please show me and please take it away. You can still keep asking. Um, and, and so Paul, he continues, but first night he said, I asked God to take, take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Uh, Paul teaches us that in the Christian life, power is found where we least expect it, right? It's like you know, my son, I, we, we bought the children a little kitchen for Christmas. And, you know, we find, I found my wallet in the microwave of this little kitchen. Like we find the riches of this life. We find the power most often in the spaces when, where we wouldn't think to find it. Like that's Christianity. That, that's the heart of Christianity right there. The most painstaking, most excruciating moment in history. Christ, the righteous one's death on the cross is the means for our salvation. The Lord uses Christ's weakness that we might spend eternal glory with him. And we get to experience the richness of his love and grace and mercy. And so Christianity, that's the way of Christ. And, uh, you know, we might ask, why? Is there any other way that God could work? Why can't he teach us these lessons? Apparently there's not. Uh, it's, it's in weakness that you'll find uh, that your power is limited. It's, it's in weakness that Christ, we, we are forced to trust God more, to trust Christ more. And when you get this, when you understand that Christ's power, his gr daily grace for you, what's that mean? His daily provision. We're called to live one day at a time. Boston, a lot of type A, a lot of planners. You, you have to really accept this to have peace in the Christian life, to enjoy God's power. He's going to provide it for you one day at a time. And it's going to satisfy. He's going to give you what you need. He's not going to, going to call you to a trial or temptation that you cannot endure uh, in his power, that you cannot store it faithfully. And so uh, in these moments of weakness, we're forced to look to him. And when you, when you get this, um, you, you're prepared for anything. You, like a madman, kind of like Paul, you do open your mind to, to step into positions of weakness for sin. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this, this is really, as my, my children grow up, this is what I want them to get from my life. Like, I know I'm not going to be the best example. I'm not going to be perfect. I want to model for them God's grace uh, and just show them my daily need for it. But really what I want them to see is that I, I took God for his word. He says, step out into weakness and let me act. And that's any preacher of the gospel. They're not up there in their own strength. If you ever suspect that, you confront them on it. Every time we share the gospel, we're not stepping out in our own power. We're stepping out in the power of our creator, our Lord, the sovereign ruler of the universe. And this should, actually when we understand it, we should understand our need for thorns. We can face anything knowing that he is with us. He is working for us. No power of Satan, our flesh, the world can withstand his power. And so we can accept his ways. It's kind of, we think he's a madman. We think, why do good people suffer? Uh, we can fight it and la step, fall into bitterness, fall into frustration and anger. Uh, but his purpose is his power, his rule and reign. It's still going to have play out and it's his cause is going to for, go forward uh, so we can accept his ways or we can resist it and we experience true peace in weaknesses insults hardships persecutions calamities 
when we take him for his word, that he's there with us and that his ways are better than our ways and that his grace is sufficient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your wisdom. Lord, you construct our lives. You have garnered our salvation uh, in just a way that we could not have imagined it. Through the death of your only begotten Son uh, with you uh, for all of eternity, before he took on flesh, uh, you gave him uh, that we might have eternal life with you, that one day we might enter into paradise, that when you make the world and the heavens uh, anew, we can experience a bliss similar to what Paul experienced. Lord, as we await Jesus' return, let us be people who just humbly uh, just walk in power. Give us strong remembrance of the moments that you moved. And we were, it's just like we were watching a movie uh, Lord, we pray, uh, let us uh, be, see your discipline with realism. Let us not turn aside from such moments, but look to you and see what you're teaching us. See the ways that we need to be humbled in such seasons. And Lord, just when we are at our wits, Lord, let your grace be sufficient for us. Let the world see us stepping out uh, in our weakness but let them see your power uh, first and foremost working through us. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.